Hello, welcome to Life Matters. I'm your host, Brendan O'Connell. Well, uh, we've had on the past uh, the personhood amendment uh, uh, shows doing both pro and con, and we're going to take another look at it today. It, it, um, it's been uh, growing. The movement has been growing and has, has experienced some ups, ups and downs. And we have with us today Josh Craddock, who's with uh, Personhood USA or personhood.com. And uh, Josh, uh, uh, could you tell us, uh, first of all, a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and how you got involved in uh, the personhood uh, movement? Sure, yeah. Thanks for having me on today, Brendan. Uh, I started out uh, with the personhood movement in Colorado back in 2008, which is the uh, first personhood amendment, uh, as a volunteer, collecting signatures, helping uh, you know, circulate the petition in churches. And then after that, I got more involved and uh, started taking a, a deeper role in the organization and helping you know, put the, the personhood amendment on the ballot again in 2010. Uh, after that, I led a youth action team to Florida where we collected uh, signatures for a personhood amendment there. And then uh, finally, I, I, when I went to New York, I worked uh, in our office in New York doing advocacy at the United Nations, trying to implement uh, personhood and, and fight back against a lot of the terrible anti-life things that the United Nations has done in various resolutions and trying to integrate personhood into those resolutions. And when you were in New York City, were you involved with an NGO? Yeah, Personhood USA is actually registered uh, as an NGO uh, at the United Nations. So we are accredited there to make statements, mm -hmm. uh, to negotiate and uh, ad advocate uh, mm -hmm. with various, you know, country missions and delegations. So it was a really interesting experience and we were able to work with countries that have actually implemented personhood in their national constitutions, uh, such as Hungary, uh, for example. Uh, and I believe they passed that in, I wanna say 2011. Uh, and other countries, especially in Latin America, for example, Mexico actually has uh, 21 states that have passed personhood measures uh, banning abortion in their states. So that was a really neat opportunity to see the personhood movement from a global perspective. Mm -hmm. I, I should say, it. Um, I've, uh, you know, had guests on regarding. Uh, I guess this past year they were trying to update the sustainable development goals. What what has occurred there? Yeah, the Sustainable Development Goals is essentially the replacement for what was the Millennium Development Goals back in the year 2000, mm -hmm. uh, most of which uh, were not achieved. And so they said, well, let's do it a second time. And uh, they negotiated a, a number of new goals. Um, unfortunately, one of, the, uh, one of the goals in particular, uh, and, and more specifically, one of the targets for those goals, uh, tries to promote abortion internationally. Uh, but one thing that the pro-life coalition at the United Nations has done is push back against that. And actually, there's a large number of countries that have pushed back against abortion being any sort of target in the sustainable development goals. So it's been a back and forth. Um, but overall, we're pleased with how much we were able to keep out of the sustainable development goals that would have been far worse. So is there a target goal then for creating abortion around the world when those are sustainable development goals? In, in UN parlance, uh, the sexual and reproductive health and rights and those sorts of terms are usually used as code for abortion. And so everyone in the UN knows what those terms mean. Uh, even though it doesn't specifically say abortion, uh, mm -hmm. everyone knows that that's code for abortion. And so the pro-life countries and, and organizations try and fight that language, uh, mm -hmm. while, of course, the, the pro-abortion uh, countries try and put put that language into goals. I see. Now, you brought a, a brief clip with you about what really is um, the personhood of movement. Uh, would it be possible if we could uh, show that? Uh... Yeah, let's take a look. Pro-life, what is it? Is it merely to believe that every human being, every single human being has dignity and an incalculable value? What does it mean to really be pro-life? Is it a state of mind? Is it merely being brought to tears at the thought of an innocent child being disposed of, like damaged property? What does it mean to be pro-life? Is it a commitment to activism? Is it merely going outside an abortionist's office, praying and providing counseling to young women? What does it mean to be pro-life? Is it a political question? Is it merely voting for the right candidate, picking the right judge, voting for the right party? Is it a religious question? Is it really going to church, worshiping the Lord, praying for aid and comfort for the needy? Is it a moral question? Is it merely to do what is right 
to do what is written on our hearts and do it now? Is it a scientific question? Is it only about our understanding of human physiology, facts, and figures? What does it mean to be pro-life, truly pro-life? To be pro-life means all of these things and more. To be pro-life is not to give up, not lower our standards, and not settle for the protection of just some. Not be afraid of defeat, of the future, of death. To be pro-life means to live for others and get off the couch right now to bring the church to the streets, bring the streets to the polling place, and bring healing to our world. What does it mean to be pro-life today? Well, I can sum that up for you in just one word. Well, now, Josh, uh, uh, that clip, uh, what does that evoke uh, with people? Does it get them off the couch, that sort of thing? Yeah, we've, uh, we've seen a lot of engagement, and I think it, it really boils down to the fact that personhood goes to the core of what it means to be pro-life. Uh, every person is unique and made in the image of God and has incalculable worth and dignity. And one of the things that you know, we use as, a, as an image for that is actually the fingerprint. Uh, so in our, in our logo, we have a fingerprint, and that represents the fact that each human being is totally unique. It's a signifier of our uniqueness. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's interesting that the fingerprint begins to develop in the womb uh, at about the same time that most abortions are performed. And so that fingerprint represents a human being that has never been, uh, you know, never existed in the past and never will exist again in the future. Every human being is so singular and unique in that fashion. And so... It's a, represent, it's a representation of what personhood really is, that people are human beings with dignity. They're persons, not property. Mm -hmm. And uh, the personhood amendment, the first time it came out in Colorado, it got beat pretty yeah. soundly. And a, a second time, and, and in other parts of the country, how are the pro-death lobby, how are they trying to portray you or to scare the public uh, and then how does your organization counteract that? Or what lessons have you learned so that ne the next time it were to go on a ballot uh, that you would be more successful? Yeah. Well, I think what we've found is that um, Planned Parenthood and the abortion lobby have tried to change the subject because they know they can't win on the abortion issue. So they try and talk about everything else. So they try and say that personhood would ban in vitro fertilization or that it would ban birth control. And even they've even gone so far as to say that it would uh, you know, force women to be prosecuted for miscarriages. And of course, all of those are completely ridiculous because what we've shown with personhood is that personhood isn't going to ban in vitro fertilization because even though it would uh, force reforms on the industry so that they can't dispose of human life, it wouldn't ban the process of creating life in vitro fertilization. Are you saying frozen embryo embryos? Correct. We're saying that personhood uh, would require reforms in the inter in, in vitro fertilization industry so that frozen embryos couldn't be killed or discarded. Uh, but it wouldn't ban the process of creating life. Nor would it interfere, of course, you know, Police aren't going to investigate women for miscarriages. Think about, uh, Brendan, before, before Roe v. Wade in this country, police weren't investigating women for miscarriages when abortion was illegal in the United States. And when you look to countries like Ireland... Well, actually, they, they um, uh, threatened to take away, and they did take away some doctor's licenses. It wasn't the woman itself. However, those doctors could then reapply for their license, and some, I think, got, got their licenses back, medical licenses. Yeah, but about. in cases of accidental miscarriage, no one was, you know, being chased down by the police, you know, for a tragic circumstance like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you look to countries like Ireland, for example, or Chile, which have uh, personhood laws in their constitutions, uh, you know, th those countries aren't hunting down women who have accidental miscarriages. So these, these are scare tactics that Planned Parenthood uses to try and scare people away from the personhood amendment. 
But what we've found is that actually every time we bring back the personhood amendment and put it on the ballot, we've actually increased the percentages of, of voters who support it. So in 2008, as you mentioned, the, you know, we, we lost pretty soundly. It was about 27%, which in political, uh, political you know, referendums, that's, that's being beat pretty soundly. Mm -hmm. But we came back two years later and had about 30%. So that was a 3% increase. Mm -hmm. And then in 2014, we came back a third time. And that time, we got 36% of the vote. So we found mm -hmm. that every time we brought it before the public, more and more people were getting the personhood message seeing through the lies of Planned Parenthood and actually going out to vote to support personhood. So we found that very encouraging. May, may I ask, uh, how much was spent on the Planned Parenthood pro-abortion side with all the political things versus your side? I mean, our, our side typically has less money than the other side. Yeah. Uh, was that the case uh, in uh, the personhood amendment in Colorado? Absolutely. Actually, in 2014, uh, the last personhood amendment that was on the ballot, uh, Planned Parenthood outspent personhood 1,300 to 1. So actually across... 1,300 to 1? That's right. And that was in Colorado, and we still gained percentages. So it was, if I was in Planned Parenthood shoes, I'd be shaking my boots because that's scary that they were spending that much money against personhood and still lost ground. So, yeah, we were definitely facing an uphill did, battle there. Did you do any television advertising? Because that's most expensive. We, we did uh, minimal te television. It was primarily, we did some radio advertisements, and we did mm -hmm. a lot of events, just grassroots events around the, uh, around the country and uh, around the state in various cities and communities and churches. And can you speak to uh, your other personhood amendments, like I think, believe, was it Mississippi and North Dakota? Yeah, there have been a few other states. Uh, the Mississippi and North Dakota had ballot referendums similar to Colorado's. Mm -hmm. uh, and then personhood legislation has actually been introduced in uh, almost every other state in the union. Uh, so, you know, we're continuing to work hard to, uh, to build up, you know, legislative support in various legislatures uh, and really... You know, Brendan, our, our perspective on this is that it's a, it's a social movement. And so we're building grassroots support across the country. And so that as soon as one of these dominoes falls and a certain state passes personhood, we want to see a, a, a tidal wave of states across the union beginning to do the same thing. And once that momentum starts to shift, I think we'll see a very different legal reality as the political reality on the ground uh, has changed. Such as what? Well, for example, take the, take the same-sex marriage movement. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you looked at some of the, the, the various ballot initiatives in certain states to protect marriages between a man and a woman. And you see 32 states actually passed those referendums. Mm -hmm. But as the culture started to shift and people's ideas about what human rights or dignity meant and equality, as those ideas started to change, that's when you started to see a different legal reality insofar as they even went to the Supreme Court, which on paper uh, was you know, in favor of, uh, you know, every uh, Supreme Court justice had been nominated by a president that opposed gay marriage, uh, and yet they still went to the Supreme Court and won. So I think that what the other side is doing, for example, with gay marriage and with uh, m medical marijuana laws around the country, is they built grassroots support so that the Supreme Court uh, has to acknowledge the political realities of a shifting culture whose values have changed. So if we can do that with life to help people understand that human dignity starts at conception because human life starts at conception, I think then we'll see a very different outlook in the Supreme Court. Well, say that uh, you do, you are successful state by state. What what happens next? Is there a, a human life amendment? I think that could be uh, certainly one option. Hopefully, uh, you know, I think that uh, we, I would like to see the Supreme Court begin to acknowledge uh, and recognize, as as they've done in other cases, uh, that the Fourteenth. I think I would hope that they would recognize that the Fourteenth and Fifth Amendments already protect all human persons uh, within these United States. Uh, but I think that a human life amendment is certainly a noble goal, and I think that's the end game for the, the, the pro-life movement as a whole. And with, if there is a human life amendment, does that trump the U.S. Supreme Court, which seems to be handing down so many decisions in our society that have been, um, well, poor decisions. In hindsight, they're yeah. poor decisions. We, we've had, you know, regarding slavery, that. That decision was eventually overturned. Roe v. Wade, uh, uh, she 
Roe of Roe v. Wade. She wanted to overturn Roe. Roe and, yeah. And then I've had on here, I, I had the guest for Doe v. Bolton, which was the companion case, mm -hmm. handed down the same day as Roe v. Wade, which said you can have an abortion up till birth for any reason whatsoever. And she tried really hard to overturn that decision, um, which is a shame. Now, in uh, the pro-life movement, there's, I call, two camps. There's the incrementalist versus the absolutist. Nellie Gray, who organized the March for Life, was an absolutist. She felt um, the Nuremberg trials uh, were a, 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 an example of um, that human life should be not compromised whatsoever. Uh, and I would say that the personhood faction or group uh, kind of is in that camp. And then you have the incrementalist camp. Uh, do you fault the in incrementalist camp, or do you find yourself at war with them uh, ideologically? How, how would you characterize it? Well, I think from our perspective, personhood, supporting the dignity of all human beings from conception to natural death is something that I think that you know incrementalists and what you'd term absolutists uh, should be able to agree on uh, as the end goal of the entire movement. And so how we get there is another question, and I think that's something that uh, the personhood amendments have certainly done, uh, and actually, I think, probably helped the incremental movements, is we've taken a lot of the fire from Planned Parenthood and the pro-abortion lobby. Uh, while they're spending and advertising campaigns against personhood, and making us out to seem very radical, I think a lot of the abortion uh, regulations and incremental legislation that uh, you know groups like National Right to Life are passing, uh, I think that they're probably taking a lot, of, they're passing under the radar because they don't look as extreme, say, as personhood. So mm -hmm. I think that we've actually done them a little bit of a service in their goal. But yeah. I think that the personhood amendment itself, I think it, it's a little bit misunderstood, perhaps, by some in the incrementalist camp. How so? I think that a lot of people in the incrementalist camp think of it as a purely, uh, they're thinking within the confines of what we can get past Roe v. Wade, right? Working within that framework of Casey and Roe and what we can try and do to to, to pass a law that the Supreme Court will uphold. Whereas our perspective is to try and sh ask for it all, and then, uh, you know, even if we fall short of that, we don't pass in a specific state. That's not the end of the, uh, end of the movement by any, any means. That's just a trigger event along a path to success. So like I said, we take a so social movement approach where we grow and steadily grow support among grassroots mm -hmm. and change people's minds and change the culture. And I think that affects the legal reality of what the Supreme Court will be willing to uphold in the future. So I think we try to avoid a myopic legal approach of just working within the confines of what the Supreme Court has given us. And we try and branch out to think more broadly in terms of a social movement. Mm -hmm. And. Uh do you, um, well, feel it uh, or see that happening anytime soon, or uh, is there a way to uh, say, okay, okay, we're going to really push the human? I guess the ball rolling. I know that I was really quite amazed that your organization says you're the fastest growing or the largest pro-life movement, I found that. Yeah, the uh, largest grassroots uh, pro-life organization. I was taken aback by that because I thought it might be National Right to Life claims that or American Life League or yeah, some, yeah. Someone, some organization like that. How, how, how do you quantify that or how do you how can you make that claim? Yeah, we've actually collected over 1.5 million signatures uh, for personhood. And so we've collected all these uh, signatures, you know, people signing our grassroots petitions, people mm -hmm. signing petitions online. And we've collected all those into pretty much the largest pro-life database in the country. And so we're actively engaging with those people, uh, working with them to you know, promote uh, human life initiatives in not only in their state level, but even at the local level, some local initiatives on the county and city level. Mm. Um, so we've been working on a lot of those things. And, and so that's, that's where that claim comes from. I see. Well, very interesting. It's, uh, um, I'm, you know, I've, I've had, you know, the other side come in and they argue that, that well, it's just unfeasible, it, you know, that we think that, uh, you know, if we can get a president in with a Congress that's uh, pro-life, that eventually that's the easy way to, and then appoint Supreme Court justices right. that would be pro-life. Um, by the way, I, I didn't introduce you, you're attending uh, 
Harvard Law School right now. That's right. I'm in my first year there. How do you like it? It's been great. In fact, I, I was uh, had the pleasure of uh, having Professor Marianne Glendon, actually, as one oh, of my professors last yeah. semester, well-known uh, pro-life right. uh, legal thinker. and uh, Yeah, she's been a guest Catholic. on this show in, yeah. the, in the years past, too. So, And my, my dad went there for a while. So, um, Now, uh, do, do you have initiatives coming up in any other states, or uh, what's the game plan kind of... Uh, as far as that is concerned. Yeah. Well, right now we're working on uh, quite a number of small local initiatives. I'll give you one example. In uh, Colorado Springs, I'm sure you heard about the, the, the shooting at the Planned Parenthood in Colorado Springs mm -hmm. just recently. And so one thing that we've been working on within the community of Colorado Springs is actually to pass a local human life resolution, personhood resolution, uh, that calls abortion clinics places of violence that attract violence and basically call on this, uh, you know, members of who live in, people who live in Colorado Springs um, to pass a resolution that would not allow abortion clinics to be, uh, to be built or to operate within uh, the city limits. And so, we, you know, there's many examples of this, uh, you know, localities passing these sorts of resolutions on issues like fracking or medical marijuana. So we think it's a promising initiative uh, that we can try in some local areas. And can you get the financial backing to get the political backing for the, on the small scale then? Is that, is that the idea? Whereas statewide, it would cost a lot more money. It does cost a lot of money to do a statewide initiative. And of course, you know, we want to uh, put our best showing uh, you know, if we do a statewide initiative. So I think that one of the things strategically we can do to promote a statewide initiative in the future is to win some of these uh, local battles, uh, passing these resolutions to build momentum toward another statewide push, especially in Colorado, but elsewhere as well. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting, uh, Colorado, that uh, it's kind of, I, I know focus on the family left Southern yeah. California and then uh, opened up in Colorado Springs, and, and yet you have other organizations that are very contrarian to focus on the family. Uh, what, what, do you see it as a, a battleground, Colorado Springs, uh, uh, in Colorado itself? I think Colorado Springs is, you know, <clears throat> more on the side of focus on the family, certainly. Uh, Denver, a little bit more, quite a bit more liberal. Uh, it's interesting, the state of Colorado is truly a bellwether for the nation. It's a purple state, a battleground state in mm -hmm. every uh, national election. And so it's an interesting testing ground for the personhood movement uh, that each time we've been able to craft a message that, that goes to that purple state uh, voter demographic and you know, what appeals to them and really testing that for the entire nation. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, um, uh, I was going to ask you, uh, wh where do you see a personhood a movement being successful, or wh what would you like to see? Uh, for instance, you're going to have to counter the arguments that the other side puts forward. Wh what do you hope to see? What's your vision of that uh, the future? Well, I think that one thing I, I hope to see is an increase uh, in more and more people becoming educated about the issue and learning more about what personhood means and stands for, and really cutting through, like you mentioned, the, per the misinformation from Planned Parenthood and the abortion lobby. Um, and I think that that's the success that, that we would want to see. Uh, I think it's also an indicator of success that we've had several presidential, large, uh, you know, notable presidential candidates even come out and endorse personhood. Uh, so I think that's a signal of the success and the growth of the personhood movement as a legitimate uh, strategy and uh, movement within the greater pro-life movement. Mm -hmm. And may I ask, who are those presidential candidates that um, have supported or believe, I guess, in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment? Yeah. Uh, well, a few of them are, uh, Mike Huckabee has been very outspoken about enforcing the 5th and 14th Amendment. Uh, Ted Cruz has, has also endorsed personhood in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, Rick Santorum in uh, the last presidential election signed the personhood uh, pro-life presidential pledge. Um, mm -hmm. So we have, we have several uh, of the candidates that are, that are you know, in the running right now. As you know, Ted Cruz is doing very well. And so you know, these are viable candidates who are uh, very supportive of the personhood movement. So that's encouraging to see. Well, Josh Craddock, thank you so much for uh, coming on today and traveling all the way from Cambridge, Mass. <laughs> to Boston, Massachusetts, and uh, with his one-year-old son and uh, beautiful wife. Well, thank you for coming on the show today. Thank you so much, Brendan. Appreciate right. you having me. Okay. And we hope uh, you found today's show to be unique, informative, content-rich, truthful, and thought-provoking. Thanks for watching. I'm Brendan O'Connell, your friend for life.